Okay, so this is uh, some work done um, with my grad student, Emily Denton, who just graduated. There's a picture here, so she's now currently uh, Google Research. Uh, and this is all about doing unsupervised learning um, through video prediction. Now, you know, we all know we've got some, you know, these great, uh, you know, supervised models uh, that we train on things like ImageNet. And there, of course, you know, it's very clear what the, somehow the target should be for your, uh, your big deep net, okay? You have these human-provided labels. But in the unsupervised setting, you know, you don't have these labels. And so it's very unclear kind of, you know, what should be the target for your network and indeed what should be the input. And so one uh, you know, approach to doing this is to uh, essentially take your signal and take, you know, break it into two pieces, you know, take one piece as the input and then try and predict the other piece. Okay, and so just you know, in the example, if you had say an image, you could perhaps you know remove some chunk of the image and then try and in-paint that from the surrounding region. Okay, so that would be one example. Or as, as we're going to look at in this talk, you could imagine taking a video sequence, you you, you feed in say the first you know uh, you know set of frames, and then you try to predict subsequent ones going further on into the future. Um, and the idea there is then that the sort of predictions your model makes, you can compute the difference between those predictions and what actually happened in the future frames, and that gives you an error signal that you can use for training. Okay, so this is a paradigm, you know, I mean, it's a fairly sort of natural thing. I guess some folks in the machine learning vision communities call this self-supervised learning. Um, and indeed, there's been a sort of whole, you know, sequence of papers, you know, f you know looking at different ways of doing this. Some folks have managed to sort of, you know, parse it as a sort of classification problem. For example, trying to look at the relative location, say, of a pair of patches in an image. Um, and, uh, and so then people have also done this on, you know, different ways of doing this in video, where perhaps you're sort of trying to track patches in a video, and you can sort of pose this again as a sort of self-supervised problem. And also looking at ro robotics applications, where you might try sort of various grasping actions and things like that. So, um, so the, the, this talk's gonna really just focus on, I guess, the sort of, you know, perhaps as you can think of perhaps the simplest one, which is where we're gonna be given some frames, and you're just trying to predict, you know, say, you know, a sequence of frames going to the future, okay? And then, We'll compute errors, you know, there's, typically in this work, we're just gonna be thinking about just predicting one frame ahead and then using that as a training, as a training signal, the error of that to update the, uh, the model. Okay, and so the beauty about this is, of course, it's extremely simple, you know, you no, don't need any explicit labels, you just need to have a source, you know, videos from somewhere and you can train things. And of course, it's challenging though, because if you're gonna just be using, sort of making accurate predictions for sort of complicated scenes, you really have to understand how the model works, the, the real world works. And so, you know, this is where hopefully the deep net's gonna come to the rescue, that we're able to, you know, they'll have enough sort of power to be able to do this in a reasonable way. Okay, so just to sort of motivate why, you know, this is, like, might be a good sort of approach to doing your unsupervised learning. Um, so the hope would be that if you can make those predictions correctly, maybe sort of in the, in the depths of the model, there are sort of high level representations that you would, would need to be able to make accurate predictions of the future that could also be useful for other tasks like uh, you know, object recognition, you know, object classification, and so on. And so in this sort of self-supervised learning community, there's a whole little bunch of, um, you know, uh, 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 sort of, uh, there's a whole series of kind of um, approaches to essentially uh, trying to train your representation using this, these unsupervised learning mechanisms and comparing them to supervised you know, pre-training methods, you know, which, which, which come from ImageNet. And then you can take those representations and you can then train little classifiers on top and see how well they do on various data sets, okay? And so, of course, they typically don't do quite as well as ImageNet, but they still do something pretty reasonable and useful. Um, and then the sort of, uh, another application is to actually try and use the predictions themselves in some way. So one, for example, could think about using them, using this model you have of being able to predict, you know, what's gonna happen in the future as uh, something you could use for planning. Or, or, uh, for, so for example, if you have a, you could think about that model as a little simulator of your world, and you could then roll that out into the future and try out you know, various potential courses of action you might take in your environment, all right? And then you could figure out sort of which ones you might think might lead you to some sort of high reward in your current uh, setting. And, um, and then if, indeed, if we're talking about deep nets, the one beauty would be that then the model is actually, you can back prop through it, so you could then sort of optimize the sequence of actions that you would want to take. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll get back to this at the kind of end. Um, so just to talk about why this is actually a challenging problem. So the first thing you hear is that, you know, how, what space do you want to make your predictions in? So the most natural one, of course, is pixels. But when you have pixels, you know, you're, you're predicting all these sort of irrelevant details in some sense, like sort of the fine texture of the carpet or something like that in your, in your sequence. 
Um, and, and in practice, of course, probably what we really care about is sort of predicting kind of the high-level <laughs> dynamics of the objects moving around and things like that. And those, of course, you know, are sort of aren't direct. I mean, they're, they're present, of course, in the pixels, but they're just sort of not so easy to access for the model. So ideally, we'd like to be able to do the prediction in some high-level space, but then how do we train that sort of, how do we get to that high-level representation in the first place? How do we train that kind of feature extractor? So I'll come back to that at the, I'm going to, I'm going to have to present sort of two different algorithms, really, and I'll come back to this one at the end. Um, but the one that actually is particularly challenging, I think, is the fact that the future is uncertain. So if you have, um, and, and you're, in your training set, you're only going to see one of those futures, okay? And so the idea, of course, is that you, um, you need to somehow still be able to you know, train from that. And you can, so a little example, you can imagine you have a ball. When that ball's you know, in the air, it's fairly deterministic, but when it hits the ground, just the uncertainties of exactly the surface it's hitting and so on means it's going to come off at a range of different um, you know, trajectories. And if you um, predict, in some sense, the wrong one, then you're going to get an error signal, which is going to, it's going to tell you somehow. It could be, you, your model could make a plausible prediction, but the one that just happens not to match the exact uh, you know, sort of you know, random outcome that occurs in nature. And so in, in practice, if you're doing this at the sort of pixel level, that's going to result in these some very blurry uh, predictions. Uh, and so if you're then trying to roll forward into the future, everything will degenerate very quickly. And so um, there's a sort of bunch of, a, you know, quite a lot of people are working on this video prediction problem, and there's a, several approaches to kind of modeling this sort of distribution of possible futures. Um, so just to talk through them, so one is to have some kind of adversarial loss, like using a GAN or something like that, and that lets you in some sense predict, you know, you're matching that distribution, so you can sort of uh, try to get your, the distribution of, of outputs produced by your model to match the distribution of, uh, you know, future frames that you would, you would have present in your data, okay? So, the, um, so the, there's a whole bunch of approaches that use that. I guess a lot of these things have all been explored very recently. Um, you know, they obviously have those, the same problems you have with GAN, sort of missing modes of the distribution, certainly, you know, a couple crop up here. And also you have the sort of typical sort of artifacts that you normally see with GANs um, appearing somehow in the predictions as well. Um, the, uh, the one that I'm going to talk about is actually if you, using latent variables. So the idea is you would have a sort of you know, a latent variable, and a particular instantiation of those latent variables will correspond to a particular future that you will see. Okay, and so a bunch of folks have been exploring this, and indeed, I mean, some of this this work that's been going on is actually very similar to the, to the stuff I'm going to present. I'll just explain a little bit how it differs. And then finally, you know, if you're able to, of course, one nice, very nice way of making is of handling uncertainty is to have a discrete distribution, and then you can easily handle multiple modes. But obviously, if you have a big sort of high-dimensional signal like a video sequence or you know an image, it's hard to do that, hard to represent that as a discrete object. And there's a line of work uh, from DeepMind uh, folks on sort of you know predicting kind of in a raster scan fashion, one pixel at a time. But for each pixel, you then can have a little discrete distribution over the, the intensity values it should take on. Okay, so the, this is the work I'm going to talk about. This came out uh, earlier this year. Oh, sorry, just I guess last year. So basically, the idea is it's going to be some you know, big autoencoder where we're going to be using deep nets uh, to sort of take, this is going to be an input frame, a T minus one. We're going to map this to some sort of high-level feature representation. And then it's going to be passed into an LSTM, which is going to essentially sort of record the kind of temporal structure that's present in our video. And then it's going to be passed, you know, that's going to output some other feature vector, which will go through a decoder. And that's going to be another big comp net, okay? So these are going to be sort of, you know, kind of you know, big kind of, uh, I think I've forgotten the exact architectures we used, but they're sort of the things you might find from, say, a DC GAN or something like that. So they're not, they're not super, super deep, but they are sort of reasonably deep. Now, um, the idea, of course, is if you're just trying to, this is a deterministic pipeline. So if you're just trying to predict the future from your previous frames, uh, that's fine, but then, you know, as I say, the whole difficulty here is that we need to be able to predict not just a single outcome, but a sort of range of plausible outcomes. And so the way we can do that is to, is to sort of concatenate in an extra um, uh, variable here that will be drawn from some prior distribution, okay? And uh, this, you can, the way to think about it is this, so this is, the left-hand side here is a sort of deterministic pathway, and the sort of stochasticity, the sort of unpredictability, unpredictable part, in some sense, of the, of the future is gonna come in uh, through, by drawing this uh, uh, particular set of latent variable Z from this prior distribution. And they sort of keep, yep. Um, yes, yeah, so, so, the, um, so uh, this, what will happen is, right, so in sort of naive ways of doing this, you might just think this would be some fixed distribution. So if you, this is a very reminiscent, perhaps for some folks, of variational autoencoders, in which case this will be just a single, it's a very simple sort of zero mean unit variance Gaussian, 
But in this work, what we're going to do is to actually learn a prior from training data, which will then, of course, capture a lot more structure and hopefully give us kind of latent variables that are a lot more useful and informative and let us do better predictions. And I'll show you sort of, you know, what happens if you, uh, if you, you know, if you, as you change this distribution to simpler things uh, and so on. Okay, and so the key point here is that this prior is going to, this prior is going to actually have an, it's going to, we'll tie these encoder blocks together. So the, the encoders will be the same, but this is going to be a separate little um, LSTM, which will capture kind of, uh, you know, the temporal structure of the, what's happened in the past. And that, that will be then used to sort of predict, you know, a mean, this little Gaussian, and also a, a diagonal covariance matrix as well. And then, so, and then the point is that these, the mean and the, and the uh, covariance matrix are going to change each time step. And so that therefore the distribution is going to be mod, you know, change considerably. So you'll be able to, you, the sort of latent variables you're drawing here will, won't just be coming from some simple Gaussian. And so this whole framework is basically, oops, sorry. So that's the, that's the, that's the model. So I'm just going to describe how we actually train this thing in the first place. So the way we're going to do it is, again, we're going to, it really is a sort of, um, sort of variant, basically, of a sort of variational autoencoder. And so the, in, uh, just as in there, what you have at training time, you have an inference network, which tells you how to sort of get from your input representation up to your latent variables. Okay, and so this is going to be a separate little ne um, network here, which we're going to use. The encoders, I guess, are tied, but then there will be a separate LSTM here. And so this uh, training time will have access to the true future frame, okay? Now, of course, if you do that, you think, well, the, the thing could cheat, and it could direct, just directly copy this frame into the Z, and then you wouldn't need this, uh, the rest of the pathway here at all. So what we do is, you know, you can control the dimensionality of this representation to act as a kind of bottleneck. So it has to sort of distill the kind of really useful information that's not present in the deterministic part of the network and use that then to sort of make good, accurate predictions of the future. And so, um, just to be clear, this, this will not be available when we actually want to generate in re at sort of test time, as it were. And so, the, this, whole, this whole setup here is going to be trained um, using the sort of um, objective function you have in a variational autoco, which is this evidence-based lower bound. And so, there are two terms to that, really. So, one is you have a, a reconstruction loss that tells you, you know, how, we, how you measure your, your difference between your, your true future frame and the prediction you've made. And so we, we, in this work, we just do something very simple, which is to use a simple L2 loss. You know, you could imagine augmenting this, as some of our, co our colleagues have done at Berkeley, with, some, with a sort of uh, adversarial term as well. Um, so that's one part of the objective function. And then what we're also going to do, as I mentioned, is we, we have this prior, which is going to be learned, OK? So what we're going to do is to, is to basically, this, this piece is going to be learned. And then this is, um, will also be learned too, but the key difference here is that, let me just describe here for a second. So the key difference is that these two pathways, even though they've got the same sort of architectures, this one gets access to the true future frame, okay? And this one only gets access to sort of the past, you know, previous information, as it were. And the idea is that you're gonna try and put, you know, use a sort of KL term to pull these two Gaussians to close to be close to one another. Okay, so in this way, you, this is effectively going to mean you're going to learn, this prior will, will then learn something interesting about how to predict, you know, these latent variable Z from the set of past frames that it's seen. Well, no, because at, at training time, you won't, at test time, you won't have access to the, you're trying to predict the future frame. You won't have access. But you don't care about testing, you care about the future, right? No, 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 so this one we care about actually making accurate predictions. Um, so I mean, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll come. I'll motivate it at the end with an actual task using robots. What do we do? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, then, it, but then you wouldn't learn anything. I mean, if you did that, then these these two things. There's nothing to these things would just end up being the same distribution, basically. So you, I mean, the the, the you need um, this is a mechanism to sort of you need to pr provide at some level. This you need to provide some mechanism for giving. Uh, this distribution has to have some knowledge about what's really going on in the future. And that's why it has to have, uh, has to have actually the, the future. Frame. Yeah. Um, well, no, again, because, it, because what's going to happen is for this at test time, we, we need to be able to be operating on sort of the previous frames, right? We can't give access to the future. Okay. Um, so what's going to happen then is, right, so at generation time, we, we sort of get rid of basically that inference model, and then what's going to happen then is you have this learn prior model that we saw before, and you're going to basically just draw samples from it, and then, you know, you create, generate some frame of the future time step t, and then what's going to happen is you'll then, you know, effectively take the output there and then pass it back in, okay? So that will then become, the next time step 
you will, will pass, take, you know, pass into both the prior and then the, the standard sort of prediction, the deterministic part of the prediction pathway. Okay, so this whole thing can be trained end-to-end, -end, uh, just using standard backprop, doing anything fancy. Um, it's relatively easy to train, and you can train it on sort of, you know, real video sequence, real-ish video sequences, I should say, as we will see uh, in a moment. So just to start with, just here's some toy data. So these are, this is a little um, uh, sort of, you know, we, this is MNIST uh, with now sort of MNIST digits bouncing around in an environment, and they're deterministic when they're sort of, you know, moving around, but when they hit a, bound, a sort of edge of the box, as it were, they bounce off with a kind of random, um, you know, position and uh, orientation. Okay, and so the idea is here that they're gonna train these models. I mean, this is the single-digit version, this is the two-digit version, and so, um, when we, we train the model, we can then uh, try and look at how well it does. Now, evaluating generative models is a whole, you know, uh, major problem in, in, in of itself. Uh, so obviously, it's difficult to, you know, the qu question is how do we judge the quality of the generations? So but, but the simplest thing you could do is you compute some sort of PNSR with respect to the ground truth. Um, and so if you, if you do that, what we're looking at here is sort of time steps into the future, as it were, and then this is uh, the PNSR score. Of course, the problem is here, this, this is really, you know, comparing, you know, at the sort of per pixel level, what's going on in the, you know, in the future predictions. And so the question, of course, given that, again, there's sort of inherent randomness in the, uh, in the test sequences, how do we do this? Well, the idea is you just draw a whole bunch of samples from a model and find the sample that ends up being closest uh, to, the, to the actual ground truth, uh, particular ground truth sequence you're evaluating, evaluating against. Okay, so here we've got something where you've got a deterministic prediction, that's the green curve. We have a version here, we have a fixed prior where that doesn't change over the course of the sequence, that's the blue one, and then this is the one that changes at every time step based on the current frames. And so this is, that's one metric, and here's another one, which is the structural similarity measure that Darius Simoncelli and others came up with, which is supposed to be a little bit less sensitive to kind of exact kind of trans translations within the, uh, within the signal. So perhaps it's easy to just look at this visually. So these are just, this is the ground truth sequence here. So you condition on these first five frames, and then you're just, this is just you know, the true sequence going forward. If you, just have a if you just use a plain old LSTM to try and make predictions, you can see that it does pretty well, actually. But when the digit hits the wall and starts changing direction, and you have inherent uncertainty about what's going to happen, then um, the, you can see now that things start going, you know, it starts getting very blurry, and the digits lose their structure. Um, these are just samples from our model here, and you can see these are just Two, for the two bottom rows are two different samples, and you can see they're, just, they're the, the same until that you have a collision with the wall, and then, these, then, the, then the digits move off in different ways. But you can see they still basically retain, uh, this, this, uh, this one's getting, I guess, a little blurry over here, but they do generally retain the digit shape uh, pretty well. So just to show you some videos of these things. So when it's green, that's when you're conditioning on the first few frames, and then you're rolling out. When it's red, then you're predicting into the future, and you can see these things. These different samples here will look like sort of plausible future sequences um, that, in, that are going on. So one other fun thing you can do here is so that I just was showing you a few samples. You could question whether, you know, okay, so the whole point here was to try and capture the distribution of future outcomes. And with a little toy data like MNIST, you can actually do that. So what you can do is you can imagine, um, you know, just plotting the sort of velocity vectors um, it, it, from time step to time step um, between the frames. So this is, for example, this digit's moving down to the right. This is the little velocity vector. And what we can do is build a sort of histogram of these over all possible future sequences that might occur. And then compare them to the, to the distribution that we would get uh, from our model. Okay, so in this little example here, we have a digit moving deterministically to the left, and then it hits the wall, and then it's gonna bounce off in some random direction, okay? So the, for the first few time steps up from up until t, from time equals one to seven, it's deterministic. So in our little histogram here of, of, of velocity vectors, it's a little delta function. And then when it hits the wall, it becomes uniform. So I remember I said it was uniform, the way the data was generated was uniform over uh, velocity and direction. Um, and so, but then of course there are few subsequent future collisions which shape this over the future into some quite complicated distribution. And this is the same thing now, just, you know, we, we condition on the first five frames, and this is the, this is the same distribution of, you know, now histogramming over a bunch of different samples from the model, and you can see it's able to match, actually, this quite complicated, it doesn't get it exactly right, but it definitely gets the rough structure pretty uh, nicely. And this is just one example, you can show, there are some other ones of digits just coming in different directions, and you can see that it's able to, it doesn't, able, it doesn't always get the exact collision point correct, but it does, subsequently get the right thing. So this is showing that you are cap you're able to capture sort of quite complicated distributions of future um, events. Okay, so, um, and then the other thing you can do here is you can look at that 
remember, we have this learned prior, and that prior there was both a mean and a variance. And you can imagine, you, you might expect that variance to sort of you know, get larger when the digit hits the wall. Okay, so this is a little plot just showing that. So what I'm showing here is time on the x-axis. The dashed lines here show the time instant when the digit hits the wall in a particular um, uh, sequence. And so, what you're so there's two digits actually, so there's a red uh, time and a blue time. So, and what you see is that the variance of the model blows up um, at those time steps. So the model actually has sort of learned to predict when there's gonna be uncertainty going on uh, in the environment. Okay, so that was a sort of toy data set. So just to move um, onto a slightly more realistic one. So this is something, uh, this is a data set from Berkeley. So basically they had a robot arm uh, just nudging objects around on a table. Um, so they, they, they did record the actions, but in our work we're not actually gonna use those, we're just gonna use these videos. And so the whole point here is here, the arm's moving around in a fairly random way, it's interacting, nudging the objects, and so on and so forth. And so we're gonna try and use this data to train our model and see whether we can actually sort of come up with plausible kind of future arm motions and, and, it's, and, the, and object motions on the table. And so um, just trying to do this, uh, again, trying to quantify these the, the predictions from our model is a little tricky. This is the PNSR and SSIM metrics. Again, so this is time steps into the future. This is the, you know, uh, higher is better, I think, uh, for both of these. Um, so this would be the deterministic model in green, so you can see that doesn't do very well. Um, this work is actually the same approach, so I'm gonna compare this to this one in a little bit. This is from the folks who built the data set. Uh, so this is a, an approach where they actually used a similar model to ours, except that prior, instead of being, you know, adapting at each time step, is I think, I think it's fixed for the entire video sequence. Okay, so that's the sort of, so it's, it's simpler prior, and at least on this particular metric, it does worse, and then our model you know, does a bit better. I guess it's somewhat similar on the, on the PNSR scores, but when we see the actual generations, there will be a reasonable difference. Uh, so this is the little grand truth sequence at the top. You can see the little arm is sort of nudging the, the green ball and then moving sort of away from the camera. And then this is um, the, you know, the sample from this, this other uh, contemporary work, which is, has the highest PNSR with respect to the grand truth. And so what you can see quite quickly is that the predictions are getting quite blurry into the future. So this is the, and always the big problem here, if you're trying to roll out the future beyond a few time steps, you know, the, the challenge is to keep these sort of predictions crisp and sharp. Okay, so this is, uh, this is another work actually from the same group, slightly different approach. I think this, this is one that uses the giant LSTM model. And then this, was, this is our one, and things are staying quite crisp. I'll just show you in a second a video of the whole thing. Yeah, so this is another, a uh, little example here, I guess, of the, of, the, uh, of the model, the different models. Okay, so here's a little sort of little video clips. Okay, so this is, um, there's the grand truth sequence. You can see the arms moving around and nudging things. These are samples from our model. So each of these look uh, sort of pl plausible different future trajectories of the robot arm. And you, you can see it is actually interacting with some of the objects on the table uh, as well. So first thing to note is that the arm does actually move around in a reasonable fashion. In some of these, you can see the sort of pincers of the arm kind of opening and closing, maybe this one here, and that's just completely generated by the model. One problem which we do still have, which I, you know, all the other approaches do too, is, is that when it nudges the objects, it, the objects get a bit blurry, okay? So you know, that's something which, you know, ideally you would like, hope that the object would actually stay nice and sharp too, and it would move in a sort of plausible way. And it, so, it does sort of move, but the, but the thing gets definitely, it's not, uh, you know, crisp as and sharp as you, as you find in the, in the grand tree sequence. Um, sorry, I guess the, uh, let me have to rewind this thing. So this is, uh, this is from the sort of the, the contemporary work as well. So their thing uh, predicts out a, a shorter, even after just 10 time steps, their, um, their thing gets quite blurry and so on. Their predictions get quite blurry. Whereas this thing you can say, at least the arm itself is staying reasonably uh, crisp uh, quite a long way out. And um, this is another example here, I guess. So you can see, yeah, this, the arms are moving quite well, but then you can see these objects are getting a little fuzzy uh, in their predictions. Um, okay. So, yeah, so I think, I mean, one thing we've been sort of thinking about is how to try and improve this. Is there a way to kind of have some kind of tension mechanism to try and force the model to, to focus on these sort of smaller parts of the image where things are actually changing? Uh, so this is the sort of thing we're currently working on at the moment. Okay, so that's one piece of work. The other piece of work I want to talk about briefly was um, how to do sort of predictions somehow in not just in pixel space, which is what you were seeing just then, but also to do it, but to do it in sort of the in some high level latent space, which is perhaps easier to sort of work with. Um, and um, and 
basically what we're going to do here is to try and use a sort of factorization of the video sequence into a sort of temporally constant component and temporally varying component. Um, and of course, this is a pretty old idea. There's been you know, slow feature learning and stuff like that. So this idea has been around for a very long time. Um, and so the, the, the reason for wanting to do that in this setting is that if you can, um, mod, instead of modeling the entire scene as we've just been doing with the, with the model I described, if you can somehow just mo you know, have this temporally varying component, you only need to be able to predict that piece. And that's gonna be presumably a lot easier than trying to predict the entire signal in, in one go. Um, and as we'll see, you, this, you're able to do this in actually in some latent space, uh, this latent post space fairly easily. Okay, so just to so, so summarize, the idea is gonna take a sort of video sequence and you know, this particularly simplistic one, the idea would be you have uh, gonna have a, a special type of autoencoder, which is gonna take each frame, break it into two pieces, okay, a temporally uh, constant piece, which will be the sort of, you know, the, uh, the content, as it were, like the, you know, the background, the lighting, and so on, and the time varying piece, which is gonna be the pose of the person, and stuff like that. And so we are, what's gonna happen effectively is we'll, we'll literally have two separate encoders, um, which will extract different, you know, feature information, these will be, you know, big convnets basically, that will extract different types of information. And the idea is that then these two will be concatenated and fed back to a decoder, which will then reconstruct and we'll have some reconstruction term. Now the question of course is, is how to induce this factorization to get the kind of uh, separation that we want between these two types of signal. So in this work, what we did was to um, basically sort of leverage the observation that the pose representation, if it's carrying information just about the pose of the person, shouldn't be able to distinguish which video clip is, is coming from. So if you have two people in the same pose, basically in different video clips, uh, then those vectors should be close together, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to tell these, cam these, these um, came from different videos. And, the, and we can set this, you can sort of um, operationalize this insight but into, by using a kind of adversarial objective where basically what's gonna happen is you'll have a, an your pose encoder here and you'll present it with either pairs of frames from the same clip or pairs of frames from different videos, and then you'll have a discriminator, so this is a little bit GAN-like in its operation, you have a discriminator which is then trying to say, you know, was that from a different video or from the same video, okay? So in this case, the target for this would be one, in this case, the target would be zero, okay? And so what you're gonna do is sort of, you know, train these two things together, so this one, you know, when you, you hold this, the encoder fixed, train this discriminator, and then what's gonna happen is you're gonna fix the discriminator and try and train the pose encoder to sort of maximally confuse this, uh, this the second piece here, the discriminator. And so, if it, and in so doing, what you're gonna end up doing is, is forcing the post encoder here to not carry any information about um, the sort of which video it came from. And in practice, if you, if we, when you train this whole thing, um, this is just a little toy data, you get quite nice factorizations here of the sort of content and pose. So this is a nice, where you take the content representation from one image here and the pose representation from another, and then you can basically end up with this sort of interpret, you know, synthesizing new views that you've never seen before of a particular uh, object. In this case, it's a little, you know, computer uh, graphics rendered chair or something like that. Okay, and so you can see that this, uh, so this is quite a sort of clean factorization of the original input image. And so how's this, and so the question is, well, how's this useful for the whole video prediction problem? Well, the idea inside is this, is that basically you can just take your, use your um, content encoder to just get you a little high level representation of the content of the sequence. And then what you can do is you can take your pose vectors that you've extracted, and now you can just, you know, interestingly, just after the fact, after you've trained up that, this joint uh, encoder structure, you can after the fact just build, a, use a very plain off the shelf LSTM, you don't need to use any fancy, uh, you know, uh, model at all, and that's actually sufficient to be able to make quite nice predictions into the future of these, of these pose vectors. And then what you can do is then, the question is how do you uh, sort of actually sort of view this, well, what the idea is you can then take your, your pose, prediction, pose vector prediction at a given uh, you know, time step, concatenate it with the content thing, which is of course constant across time, and then you use a sort of standard, uh, use decoder to map back to pixels and see how you're getting on, okay? And you can then sort of visualize essentially, so this, this thing here we've got, um, the, the model I'm just, I just described is in, indicated by the orange arrows, and so the green, again, the green border indicates with the conditioning frames, and these are now generations going out into the future. And then this MCNet is a sort of, uh, you know, contemporary work basically that um, is a qu quite a complicated model that uses sort of GANs and things. And you can see, once you predict a long way into the future, you have many dozens of time steps now, sort of, you know, this is 100 times, 80, 90, 100 times into the future, you get lots of strange artifacts arising just through kind of breakdown essentially 
Um, whereas our thing stays reasonably sharp. Um, okay, so the, um, so yeah, so this is just, so you can see that uh, the, the motion sort of stays fair, you know, it still is able to preserve the motions fairly well. So this is a fairly simple data set, I would certainly agree. The backgrounds here are fairly, um, uh, you know, simplistic. So the, the question then is, well, you know, can we, basically what we're working on at the moment is trying to sort of combine this idea of kind of this factored representation. Um, so just as to be, be, be clear, the whole point here is you're doing the, the prediction model in this instance, it's just the LSTM, but it's operating in this latent space of these, these, this pose representation, okay? So the, the prediction error here is basically all done in the latent space. No, you're not comparing, making pixel space prediction errors or anything like that. Um, so the question is, well, can, you, can you combine the two ideas? And so that's what, what, what Emily's working on the moment. So their basic idea is instead of using the LSTM, you could use this, um, this, the model I described in the first part of the talk to actually do this. So this would now basically be operating now in this latent representation rather than in the pose space. So we don't have, we only have some rather preliminary results for this at the moment. Um, so this is a sort of sequence here of some of the humans data set. I guess this is, you know, um, human motion capture data. They also recorded, you know, the RGB frames as well. So the people walking around there. And so there is some at least small gain over just the baseline model, which is was the, the the, 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 the magenta uh, curve here is the uh, model I described in the first part of the talk, and then this sort of concatenation of, of that earlier model with this factor representation and doing the prediction in a latent space, so the so-called hierarchical version of the model, that's the one in uh, yellow. So there's a, some slight gain on these metrics, at least. Okay, so I just want to spend uh, you know, a few moments just motivating why this, you know, why do you actually care about the predictions that come out of these models, right? Do we, I mean, looking at pretty videos is one thing, but why is, what's it actually useful for? So um, the folks um, at Berkeley who've been working on this and sort of, you know, some of the models I was showing you earlier, I mean, what they've done is to sort of close the loop in some sense. So what they've done is to train up the video prediction model, and what's cool is they've actually then used it in model-based control. So they actually basically take the, use the video prediction to sort of figure out what the consequences will be of future actions of their robot arm, okay? And then search over possible sort of, act, you know, sequences of actions to find one that will execute the particular go desired goal and use that. So this is something where it's basically the video prediction is now a crucial piece of the whole, of the whole pipeline. And in that, little, in that little example, they're able to sort of take, um, you know, this is a little scene here, this is the same sort of robot arm setup we saw before, and they can, you can click on a sort of, you know, one, an object on the, uh, in, in the environment and ask that it go, you know, that's the red blob, and then you say you want to move that object to the green blob there, okay? And so basically the, the arm through the video, video prediction model is able to figure out how to do, achieve that uh, particular objective, okay? And so, you know, the bottleneck in this whole thing is your ability to be able to predict accurately into the future, what, you know, what the consequences will be of the actions that you take, okay? So this is the, where we're sort of going with this whole thing. Um, but folks at Berkeley have got their robot set up. We have a robot, we haven't quite got it set up yet to actually go and uh, do the same thing ourselves, but that's what we'd like to try and do. Um, okay, so uh, actually, yeah, so actually I'm gonna stop there in fact because um, I leave plenty of time for questions. So yeah, so what I've been talking about here is really is a video prediction is a mechanism for doing unsupervised learning, and the models I've been talking about here combine basically the deterministic predictions with um, uh, stochastic latent variables that are gonna encode all these possible futures that you might uh, C. And then the key point here is, is, is this learn prior. So if you, do, if you do have simpler learn priors, the, the quality of the predictions you get is, is dramatically worse. And so, yeah, what we're looking to do is try and plug this into the kind of framework I just mentioned, where you actually have, you know, using this for kind of um, a model-based control and stuff like that to try and work on some, you know, real problems. Okay, so I'll stop there.